The Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation brings you Crime Photographer. Ah, Happy New Year, Casey. Happy New Year, Ethelbert. Same to you, Marvin. Hey, you know this 1948 is going to be a great year. Why so? Why don't you know? It's leap year. And just what can leap year mean to you? Why, I'm surprised at you, Ethelbert. Don't you know that that means an extra Thursday? No what? No what? That extra Thursday gives me an extra chance to say that Anchor Hawking is the most famous name in class. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Tony Marvin. Every week at this time, the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio, and its more than 10,000 employees bring you another adventure of Casey, crime photographer, ace cameraman who covers the crime news of a great city. Written by Alonzo Dean Cole, our adventure for tonight, Hot New Year's Party. Half past nine on the morning of New Year's Day. And to some people, that hour on that day can be very bleak and dismal. Ethelbert, the uh, head bartender of the Blue Note Cafe, is obviously not one of those unfortunate. For we find him in the morning. Oh, what a beautiful thing. Hi, Walter. Yes. Uh, bring up two more bottles of aspirin. They're going to be our best sellers today. Okay. Oh, what a beautiful... Well, look who's here. Happy New Year, Casey. <laughs> and the uh, same to you, Miss Williams. Hmm. What's the matter with you two? Ask Walter to bring us a couple of cups of coffee, pal. Strong and black. Uh oh. And slip me an aspirin tablet. Make that a double order. Uh oh. Hey, Walter, draw two. Come on up. What's Hermit Chittison doing here? Practicing at this hour in the morning? He couldn't get home on account of the snow. He slept here all night. Oh. Here's some special headache medicine for you to stay out all night. We haven't been stay out all night. I know. Like good, sensible folks, you left the party early, just before daylight. And then you got all of an hour's sleep before you had to come to work on an 8 a.m. shift. He's a wise guy, Annie. Yeah. You should have been like me. I wasn't on duty last night, but did I spend my leisure time in idle revelry? I did not. At 12 o'clock, my sister Edna and me wished one another a happy new year over a glass of good, healthful milk. Then I retired and enjoyed a fine, refreshing sleep. So, on this beautiful morning, you find me full of vim, vigor, and vitamins. Have another aspirin on the house. Shall I kill this guy quickly and... Listen, vim, vigor, and vitamins, the reason Miss Williams and I feel beat up is that ever since a few minutes after we reported for work this morning, we've been inhaling smoke. Smoke? There was another warehouse fire this morning, near Chatham Circle. That's the only New Year's party we've attended, and it was a red-hot one, too. Bad fire, huh? Yeah, plenty bad. Oh, here's Walter with our coffee. Oh, thanks, Walter. Happy New Year. <laughs> Boys, and welcome, too. Thanks, Walter. Okay. Your papers kind of hinted that them warehouse fires lately have been arson jobs, Miss Williams. Oh, we're morally certain of it, Ethelbert, and that Jake Schultz is the man behind them. He and his mob make a deal with the owners of them places to split the fire insurance, huh? That's right. That's the racket. Hmm. Skinny Jake Schultz is a pretty smart cookie, I hear. Neither the cops or the fire inspectors has ever got anything on him. Yeah, well, if he's behind the torch job we just covered, he isn't so smart. Now, this one lets somebody in for a hot seat wrap. What do you mean? Well, the fire was set at night and there was a human being in the building, an old watchman. That means arson in the first degree. The watchman got out all right, but a fireman was killed by falling timbers. And when death is caused through commission of first-degree arson, it becomes first-degree murder. And a reliable witness says that he saw three men run out of the warehouse a few minutes before the fire was discovered. 
he's uh, given the police a first-class description of them. Was one of them Schultz? No, of course not. Dick doesn't do any firebug stuff himself. If one of those three guys is caught and sings, uh, it's just going to be too bad for his boss, man. Annie, how about some more coffee? Mm-mm, no, we don't have time, Casey. That's We've right. got to get out to Barstow College. Well, there's no hurry about that. Yes, there know. is. City desk wants the dope on Professor Wendell right away. Well, who's Professor Wendell and what, what's he doing? Oh, he's a teacher at Barstow College. He went for a walk last night and he hasn't come back. Uh, now, the professor who shares an apartment with Wendell just reported his disappearance to the Missing Persons Bureau. Well, he thinks the guy has met with foul play? That's right. Yeah. Well, if we must, we must, Danny. Come on, let's get started at Professor Gerber's place. But this Professor Gerber's the one who reported the mysterious vanishing of this Professor Wendell. That's huh? right. After we waste our time with him, Wendell will undoubtedly show up with a perfectly good reason for staying out all night. Well, I'm perfectly willing to waste time on such cases today. I'd like to start the new year safely and sanely. Me too, Annie, me too. To establish a precedent for 1948, no jams and no trouble, nothing but peace, sweetness, and light. (laughs) Instead of just a hope, why don't you two make that a new year's resolution? Well, that's a good idea, pal. Excellent. We here highly resolve... That for the coming year... And starting now... No jams... No trouble... Nothing but peace, sweetness, and light. Professor Wendell and I have shared this apartment for over five years, Miss Williams, ever since he lost his wife. I know him, and I'm certain he wouldn't stay out all night without notifying me if... He was able to do so. Well, when did you see him last, uh, Professor Gerber? He attended a New Year's party at the Teachers Club, a, a most decorous affair, I assure you. Shortly after toasting the arrival of the New Year with a glass of sherry, he left saying he was going to take a bus to Chatham Circle. Chatham Circle? He liked to wander around there. That's a tough neighborhood. I know it, Mr. Casey, and I have repeatedly warned Professor Wendell to keep out of such neighborhoods, especially after dark. But to him, they were most interesting because of the criminal element he found there. He was interested in the uh, criminal element? Very much so. Frankly, instead of the brilliant authority on ancient civilizations which Professor Wendell has been for many years, I am certain that he would rather have been a, a, a private detective. Hmm. An amateur Sherlock Holmes. He more particularly admired a fictional character called Dr. Thorndike. Uh, Casey, if he was snooping around Chatham Circle early this morning, he may have seen something he wasn't supposed to see. Yeah, got... that warehouse fire was started early this morning, Annie. A warehouse fire? Look, will you give us a description of your friend, Professor Gerber? Uh, Clarence Wendell is a small man, about five feet three, I should say, yeah. and he weighed not more than 130 pounds. He had light blue eyes, thin gray hair, and wears gold rimmed spectacles. Last night, he wore a dark blue overcoat, black and uh, uh, Casey. Hey, Professor, did you give that description to the cops when you reported him missing? Oh, of course. I gave them a photograph of Clarence. And it didn't mean anything to them? Mean anything? Well, it exactly fits a witness description of one of three men who ran out of the Chatham Circle warehouse early this morning, of just before it caught on fire. I, I don't understand. Well, the missing persons bureau men who talked to Professor Gerber wouldn't necessarily know about that arson business, Annie. Oh, no, that's right. It's being handled by the uh, homicide squad. Will you please explain? Well, there's more important things to do first, Professor. If you don't mind, where's your phone? I want to call Captain Logan of Homicide and get him to check with missing persons right away. That's all you're going to do, Casey. Just phone. Remember our New Year's resolution. Casey, I got hold of that warehouse witness right after you phoned me. When he looked at the photograph missing persons had of Professor Wendell, he identified it immediately. Wendell was the little guy he saw coming out of the warehouse, Logan, right? Yeah, between the two other men. Uh-huh. He hasn't been able to identify the others from pictures in our criminal file. Wait a minute, the witness saw Wendell between the other guys? Yeah. Now he recalls that both had a grip on the little man's arms. Well, when Professor Wendell was playing detective last night, he accidentally stumbled onto the arsonist while they were setting the fire, and they kidnapped him to keep him quiet. That's where it looks, Miss Williams. It doesn't help us find Wendell or the firebug. Well, like the uh, fire inspectors, you think that Jake Schultz mob is behind him? Sure, but suspicion and proof are very different things. We have a single lead to work on. Professor Wendell's a definite lead. He's a definite complication. Huh? If two of Schultz's torches put the snatch on him this morning because he caught him setting a fire, they probably bumped him off by now. Oh. Uh, Logan, I don't think Professor Wendell has been bumped off. 
Why? Casey, the gang won't dare let him live if he saw what we think he did. Oh, they'll give him the works eventually, Annie. But Jake Schultz is going to do a whole lot of thinking before he okays a murder that would hit the front pages and stay there. Logan Jake's in the fire business, but he does his best to avoid strong heat. Yeah. I'll have Skinny Jake and his mob brought in. We'll force information out of him. Ah, you won't force anything out of Jake or his mob. That's been tried before. Do you know of anything else we can try? I can try something. You? Yeah. What? I'll have to keep to myself. There can't be any cops in the picture, Logan. Meaning you know some crook who might be persuaded to spill? Meaning you ask no questions and I answer none, now or later. Okay. Help me find Professor Wendell alive and you can write your own ticket. Attaboy, Logan. Thank you. I'll get started right away. Now stick around your office here and I'll phone you after I make my contact. I'll be near the phone. So long. Oh, I'm going with you. See you later, Captain. Okay, Miss Williams. And carry your luckiest horseshoe, Casey. Yeah, I guess I'll need it, pal. Oh, what are you going to do, Casey? Annie, I'm going to leave you as soon as we reach the street door. Not unless you tell me what this is all about. Look, kid, I can't tell anybody. Well, then I'll trail you. Well, if you do, you may wreck the one chance of finding Professor Wendell alive. Okay. Well, just tell me one thing. Off the record. Where are you going? Completely off the record, Annie. Nick Morrow's Tavern. Well, the Schultz mob hangs out at Nick Morrow's. Jake Schultz owns the place. Yeah. Casey, you'll be sticking your neck out down there. Quite a few of the mob know you. Schultz knows you. I'll be okay, Annie. Well, maybe. Resolutions are so easily broken, Casey, we should only have hoped for a safe and sane 1948. probably met jadeite dinnerware for the first time because jadeite is the perfect solution to the problem raised by an unusually large number of guests. Jadeite cups and saucers, jadeite dessert plates and salad plates, jadeite dinner plates, soup plates, vegetable bowls and platters are as lovely as Chinese porcelain. They're as heat-proof as the Fire King oven glass you use for baking, yet they're so inexpensive that you can buy all the extra pieces you need for entertaining without making a dent in your budget. For example, jadeite cups and saucers cost only 15 cents for the two pieces, and you can buy a complete 35-piece dinner service for six for less than $5. Now, you'll find jadeite dinnerware at chain stores, hardware stores, department stores, and all other stores selling chinaware and glass. Ask for jadeite by name. Now, it's spelled J-A-D-E-I-T-E. Jadeite, newest triumph of anchor hawking. The most famous name in glass. No, Red Monahan ain't in the back room, Casey. He ain't been in the joint at all today. Oh. Well, I'll stick around, Nick. You'll probably be in later. Give me a beer, will you? Okay. The bar to a big New Year's business last night, Nick? I can't complain. Uh, you still running with the cops, Casey? Why, Nick, I don't know what you mean. I'm a newspaper guy. Sure, sure, I know. Here's your beer. Thanks, Nick. What do you want to see Red Monahan about? If it's any of your business, Nick, I want to thank him for the Christmas card he sent me. <laughs> You've been waiting here over an hour for me, Casey? That's okay, Red. That's okay. Oh, it ain't okay. You're one guy I wouldn't keep waiting for no reason. Well, look, let's sit down here. Yeah. Over the corner table there, we can talk privately. Yeah, okay. Uh, hey, Nick, we're going to sit down. Bring me and my pal Casey a drink. Okay, Red. Come on, Casey. See, it's good to see you. Yeah, take a load off your feet. Thanks. Now, what's on your mind? I'm going to ask a favor of you, Red. A favor? Yeah. I owe you a debt, fella. When I can't ever pay. My only kid would be dead if it wasn't for you. I'll never forget how you pulled her out of the river when she was drowning. Uh, here's your drinks. Oh, thanks, Nick. That's all, Nick. Thanks. Well, tell me, what, uh, what can I do for you, Casey? Right, I'll give it to you quick and straight, Red. I want Professor Wells. I don't know what you're talking about. I think you do. I know how close you are to shoot. Nick, I... 
I give him a word. If the cops don't know and won't know that I'm talking to you. All I want is that little professor, and I want him alive. Look, I ain't got the slightest idea what you're driving at, pal. I swear I ain't. So you owe me a debt, Red. Under ordinary circumstances, that's a debt that only a heel would try to collect. But under these circumstances, I ask Wendell's life in exchange for your kid. I can't give it to you. Because he's been killed? No, he ain't been killed. I tell you, I don't know anything about him. You can't lie to me, Red. Look, you're a crook, but you're not a murderer. If you don't tell me where to find Professor Wendell, you'll be committing murder right now, just as surely as though you held a gun to the guy's head. I ain't even seen that guy, Casey. I won't see him. You know what I, I mean. Keep I, your nose clean, fella. I ain't no squeal. I don't rat. You're ratting on a debt. You owe me a life. Okay, Casey, you win. I'm coming clean with you. But I had no part in anything that happened this morning. Where is the professor? He's being kept in an old house out in Bristol Road. While Schultz makes up his mind when and how to bump him off. Where on Bristol Road? East of Old Turnpike. Third farmhouse on the right-hand right. side. Third farmhouse on the right, yeah. Yeah, now get out of here, Casey. It's curtain for me if the mob finds out that I told Nobody you. will ever find it out from me, Red. Thanks a million and so on. So, I... What's the matter? So, is he in the chain? He came out of the back room with two guys of the mob. Hello, Red. Hi, Jake. Hi, Murray. That's Drex, Sam. Yeah, hi. Jason. I haven't seen you for a long time. Well, I haven't been around your way, Schultz. Nick told me a while ago that you were waiting here for our pal Red. Knowing how he feels about you on account of his kid, I decided to come over. You, uh, been in the back way? Uh-huh. I've been sitting in the back room, listening through the wall. Listening? You heard? Yeah, plenty. Walk into that back room, both of you. Your hands in sight. And you two dopes are getting into it. What are you going to do to it, Jake? Yes, can't you, Red? Yeah. And I ain't going to take it. What's that goes for me, cool Red? Don't shoot, guys. It might bring the cop. This case is getting my gap, bro. No, he isn't. You got him with your black guy. Yeah, Casey's out of the picture now, Red. I got right on the control, Jake. What's happening anyway? I'm doing just that. Now they're both out cold. Yeah, but not cold enough. You and Murray, put him in the car, Sam, and we'll all go for a ride. That's a good spot, Sam. Stop the car. Okay, boss. Well, Red, this is the end of the ride for you and Casey. Hey, they can't hear you, Jake. Huh? When you sock them back in Nick's joint, you've done an A1 job. They're still out, eh? And how? All right, pull him out of the car and roll him into the ditch here. Yeah, give me a hand, Sam. Hey, Morgan. Come on. Come on. Got him? Yeah, got him. Pull him back. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right, now get back in the driver's seat, Sam. You, Murray, give me your slug through the head. Me? Yes, you heard me. Hey, you're afraid of killing, ain't you, Jake? Oh, I'm not afraid of it. I've just been smart enough to keep myself and you guys clear of it. Now we, well, we've got no choice. But you want someone else to do it. Do it if you haven't got the guts. Get back in the car. Yeah, that suits me fine. Hey, why are you getting in two? I'll shoot from here. Sam, be ready to step on the gas when I do. This is the private road. I'll be ready. I got the bus and gear and my foot on the clutch. Let them guys in the ditch have it, Jake. All right, I, I'm letting them have it. Hey, a car's coming, boss. Huh? From behind us. Yeah, I see it. Get away, Sam. I can't. Hey, you only shot one guy, Jake. I can't do any more shooting now. Get away from that car behind us, Sam. Get away. Well, you certainly had that lucky horseshoe with you, Casey. He found Red Monahan lying beside you in the ditch with a bullet through his chest. And you, <laughs> you only had a, an egg-sized lump on the back of your head. Oh, Casey didn't get off so easy, Captain Logan. He was unconscious for almost two hours after he was brought to this hospital. Well, the doctor and... says he's all right now, Miss Williams. Yeah, it's all right, honey. I'm okay. I've been so worried. Forget it, Casey. Hey, uh, they killed poor Red. No, oh, he's going to pull through. Thought you'd get him in a vital spot. Oh, I'm glad of that. I'm glad. No, 
Read more than a half-right guy, much more. But you want to know what happened. Oh, <laughs> take it easy, pal. You were delirious for a while after they brought you here, and you did a lot of talking. You kept saying that Red Monahan had told you that Professor Wendell was being called prisoner in the house of the district room. East of old turnpike, third farmhouse on the right. And I said all that when I was out. Uh, over and over. Well, then you went to Bristol Road and found the professor. And my guys went there, pal, but too late. Schultz and the men with him evidently knew they hadn't made the case. They lost no time in taking Professor Wendell away. We found the house empty. We haven't any idea where they've taken him. Well, you found a possible lead in that Bristol Road farmhouse, house, Captain. Go ahead, showcase it. Lead? What? That thing's no lead, Miss Williams. It merely proves that Professor Wendell was in the house. What'd you find, Lord? He found a belt. A belt? Mm-hmm. With Professor Wendell's initials on the buckle. Now, take a look, pal. Miss Williams insists that these cuts in the edges of the belt mean something. Well, they're, they're fresh cuts, Casey. See? Yeah. Uh, when we found the belt in a room where Wendell was probably held prisoner, we figured that those cuts might be some sort of a tip-off about where he'd been taken from there. That hasn't worked out that way. Funny cuts, aren't they? Some straight, some slanting, and irregularly spaced. Uh, yeah, Wendell knew that an ordinary written message wouldn't help him. The men guarding him would have found it and destroyed it. I'm sure these cuts are a message in, in code. Our cipher expert at headquarters didn't recognize it as any code. Well, your chief cipher experts were taking New Year's Day off, Captain. The men on duty are apprentices. Yeah. Do you know that mean anything to you, Casey? Hmm. No, not a thing. Uh, it makes it unanimous. They're Greek as far as all of us are concerned. Uh, Greek? Hmm? Hey, Annie, hmm? wait a minute. Professor Gerbel uh, told us that, that Wendell was an authority on ancient civilizations. Uh, have you shown this belt to, to Gerber or whatever his name is, Logan? No, but I phoned him. All right, we're going to show it to him right now. Casey! Yeah. Casey, you can't get out of bed. I'm out. Beat it, Annie. Come on, let me get dressed. I want to hear what Professor Gerber says. When he sees this cut-up belt. All right, I'm going, I'm going. You're uh, right, Mr. Casey, the belt conveys a message. It it does, Professor Gerber? Yes, in the oldest secret code that history records. The ancient Spartans used it to convey secret military information. It is called Sitali. Professor Wendell hoped you'd bring this to me, Captain Logan. Uh, he did, eh? He must have. He knew I'd be able to read it. Oh, uh, why are you wrapping that belt around your arm? So that I may be able to decipher its markings, Miss Williams. You see, to write a Sitali message, the ancients wrapped a strip of papyrus, long and narrow, like this belt, around a staff of predetermined circumference. Spirally, with the edge of each spiral joining that of another. Then on the joining edges, they wrote the secret information they wished to impart. When the strip was unwound from the staff, nothing but apparently idle markings were visible on its edges. Uh, now, the belt is completely wound about my arm. See? It's message is plain? No, not to me. All I see is that the edges of the cuts meet. But the cuts form letters, Captain. Greek letters. It's Greek, Logan. Anne knows she's been to college. Uh, well, what do they say? In rough translation... They are taking me to Diana's house. Diana's house? Diana was the Roman name for the Greek goddess Artemis. Say, I'm not a shark on the classics, but I get it. So do I, Logan. Well, I don't. Neither do I. Professor Gerber, Annie, the name of Skinny Jake Schultz's best gal friend is Diana. And to get away from the classics entirely, it's Diana McGillicuddy. I never thought Schultz would take Wendell to such an obvious hideout, Casey. Neither did I, Logan, which means Schultz has been smarter than we are. Well, all right, let's go. All set, Captain Logan. We have the joint surrounded. The men are ready to break in from all sides, Sergeant. As soon as they hear your whistle, sir. I'll hear that as soon as I get to the front door. Now, you stay there, Casey. Oh, no. I got a little personal matter to settle with skinny Jake Schultz. I got a hunch he's in Diana's house. You should still be in the hospital, you say? All right, but I'm not. Okay, blow your whistle, pal. Uh, I haven't got time to argue with you. This is it, guys! Hey, hey, cops! They're coming in from all sides! Take him up! Well, that means you, Schultz! Oh, uh, no, you're not gonna take me! You're wrong, Jake! Oh, hey, Casey! I owe him a KO, Logan. And I owe these other two mugs something to No, no, no. no. We, we've given up. Yeah, lay off, Casey. Let me go, Logan. Yeah, let me go. Cut it. This is a police job. You can take the pictures, but you can't make them. Well, all right, Logan. 
But I want good shots. With Professor Wendell in them. Where is Wendell, you bug? He ain't been hurt. He's down in the cellar. Yeah. Sergeant, bring him up. I'll get my camera set. You can't take pictures of the professor for the newspapers. Hey, not for decent newspapers. Why not, you mugs? Oh, I on account of... Because, uh, some way, uh, the professor lost the belt that kept his pants up. Yeah, and, and then some way, he lost his pants. <laughs> We'll join the crowd of the Blue Note in just a moment. You know, tonight we're nearing the end of the holiday season, and to those of you who are exhausted, here's a suggestion. A good hot cup of coffee that you can prepare in an instant, without fuss, without work, and without waiting even a minute. Now I'm talking about soluble coffee, the amazing scientific discovery which makes really delicious coffee available at a moment's notice. Now all you need is a cup, a spoon, and a glass jar. The sanitary, convenient anchor glass jar in which most of the better packers of soluble coffee bring you their products. The anchor glass jar opens quickly and simply. There's no trouble in measuring, no waste from spilling. And even more important, glass jars protect the flavor and freshness of soluble coffee against moisture long after they're opened. You'll be delighted by the delicious soluble coffees now on the market, particularly those that come to you in convenient anchor glass containers Sealed with Anchor Caps. Both products of Anchor Hawking. The most famous name in glass. Them pictures you took of Professor Wendell after he was rescued was very different, Casey the first time I ever saw pictures of a college professor wrapped in a blanket. He looked just like an Indian. <laughs> <laughs> professor Wendell didn't like to have him taken that way, Ethelbert, even though Casey was responsible for his rescue. He was uh, kind of burned up. Yeah, he wasn't as burned up as Jake Schultz and his hired firebugs are going to be. No, they're facing murder and kidnapping charges. And with plenty of evidence to back them up. <laughs> As the result of Casey busting some nice New Year's resolutions, Miss Williams. Hmm, yeah. The safe and sane 1948. You started swell. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, Wendy. Let's enlarge the idea. And no kidding. You've got something there, Ethelbert. All right, all together. Happy, Happy New, New Year, Year to, to everyone. Happy New Year to everyone. To everyone. <laughs> Crime Photographer, starring Stotts Cotsworth as Casey, is brought to you each Thursday by the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation, makers of Fire King Oven Glass, Anchor Glass Containers, Anchor Caps and Closures, all products of Anchor Hawking, the most famous name in glass.